Life's kind of funny. You try to guess where you'll end up, but you never really be sure what will happen. You'll, who you'll meet, how they might change your fortunes. Didn't expect my life to change like it did that day in the forest, but it was never the same after that. My footsteps crunched across the dry leaves as I walked through the woods in the late summer afternoon. Birds were singing in the trees and squirrels were chasing each other through the tall grass. It would have been a perfect day, if not for the fact that I was alone. Every so often I'd feel a pang of heartache at the loss of my friends back in Bridgeton, now 50 miles away. At that moment it felt as if they lived in another world. Bridgeton might as well be Mars when you're not old enough to drive after all. Why was it so hard to make new friends? I picked up a pine cone and I threw it, hard, missing the tree I was aiming for and sending it sailing through the air where it landed on a pile of leaves. Something caught my eye where it hit the ground. A glint of something shiny and gold. Walking over towards it, I reached down and was surprised to see a polished golden key. It had the symbol of the tree etched on the bow, and the blade of it was a long cylinder with teeth. I'd never seen a key like that in real life. It looked like it was right out of a medieval fantasy movie. Just then a girl in a black hooded sweatshirt came around a bend on the path. She was dark haired and tall, slender. Beautiful. I guess her to be around my age. She saw the key in my hand and raced over while I stood there dumbly looking at her. It's never very good at talking to girls. You found it, she exclaimed, looking overjoyed. The girl was suddenly inches away, and she hugged me. Unexpectedly then surprised me even further by planting a quick, berry-flavored kiss right on my lips. She stepped back and watched me blush with her astonished purple eyes. Thanks, she said, a devious smile on her face. I noticed the key was in her hand now, but I hadn't even seen her take it. Hey! Before I could say another word, she was off running. She glanced back over her shoulder and grinned at me, then disappeared off the path and into the woods. I wanted to chase after her for some reason, feeling like she'd gotten one over on me. The key had looked important, ancient, polished as if someone had taken extremely good care of it, and yet she had seemed so confident that it was hers. Maybe it was, after all. Interrupting my thoughts once more, I heard the sound of someone rummaging in the forest a little ways off to my right, then the deep voice of a man talking to himself. Where is it? It can't be missing. Must be here somewhere. It must be. Hello? I said, walking over to him. It was a tall man with gray hair and a big nose I saw, down on his hands and knees, rooting around in the leaves. He was dressed in green and brown, a canvas knapsack on his back. He carried with him a long, wooden walking stick. The man jumped up when he heard me coming. He looked at me and narrowed his eyes, appearing distrustful at first. But then he looked closely at me for a few moments and his face softened. Hello there, young man. You didn't happen to see a key on a chain. Sort of like a necklace lying around here, did you? Um, I did, actually. I picked it up just over there, I said. He ran over to me and grabbed my shirt collar, eyes wide and manic, hair askew and spittle dribbling over his lower lip. Where is it? You must give it to me. It's vital that you return it to me immediately. Seeing my scared face and the fact that I looked ready to run away... He calmed himself down slightly. Sorry, it's just that it's quite, uh, it's quite sentimental to me. It's a family heirloom, and without it, well, let's just not speak of that right now. So, do you have it? I'll give you gold for it. Plenty of gold. I have lots. He began to pull handfuls of gold coins out of his pockets, which glimmered in the dull light of the forest. They tumbled out of his hands, falling into the leaves and disappearing. He pulled more and more from his coat, tucking them into my pockets with his long fingers. He suddenly furrowed his brow. Where is it? Where is it? Hey, are you trying to pickpocket me like that like that girl back there a minute ago? What? What's with the two of you? I guess you must really be related or something. She's got it. Why don't you go ask her? The old man's face dropped. He looked furious and terrified at the same time, his eyes wide and unblinking. You fool. Where did she go? Do you realize what she'll do with that key? He stalked off into the forest, and I followed after him. Look, it wasn't my fault. 
She stole it from me. Who is she, anyway? Who are you? Why are you both so interested in that key? He spun around and practically screamed at me. That key is the only thing keeping our worlds together. We have to stop her. Oh. She's too much for me to handle on my own. I'm getting too old for this stuff. I'm going to need your help, kid. Can you do this with your fingers? He made his hand into a finger gun. Uh, uh, yeah? Good. And I'm going to take a calculated risk here and decide to trust you. You got brown eyes, so that's a good sign. At least they aren't purple. If you ever see somebody with purple eyes, just run the other direction. Got it? Um, uh, okay. All right. Here goes nothing, he said, lowering the walking stick he was carrying so that it pointed at me. The end of it started to glow a faint white, then light blue. Conigatori addicti magicae. A beam of blue light shot out from the staff, and my entire body suddenly felt warm and full of energy. It thrummed around my arms and into my fingertips before settling into a low hum, which reverberated in my ears. Whoa! What did you do to me? No time to explain. We've got an evil sorceress to stop. Just remember. Finger guns! Oh, okay. Here, hold onto my arm for a second. I did as he asked, and suddenly the entire world went white. When I opened my eyes again, we were standing apart, in a completely different area of the forest. It was located somewhere I had never been before. A huge oak tree stood before us, towering high above all the others. It seemed to have a thousand branches and a million leaves. Such an impressive tree I had never seen before, and I felt immediately protective of it. Standing in front of it was the girl who had kissed me. She held the key, and with her other hand was feeling the bark of the tree trunk and looked to be inspecting it carefully. Strangely uneasy, I felt as if she shouldn't be standing so close to it. I felt as if she had some nefarious purpose in mind. Stand back from it, Brucka. You have no business near the all-world tree. She spun around and looked at him with that evil grin on her face yet again. I watched as she lowered the key and pointed it directly at him, and he dove to avoid a gout of fire which came forth from it. The roar of it was loud and terrifying. Birds and wildlife fled from the sound. The man was on the ground, breathing heavily. He looked up at me and nodded. I remembered what he had told me and made the finger gun with my right hand, pointing it at the girl dressed in black. I realized already she'd kill us both if given the chance, but I had no idea what would result from my decision. Surprisingly, a bolt of energy like white lightning burst for my fingertip, striking the girl square in the chest. She went flying, dropping the key and causing the fire blast to cease immediately. The man ran over to the key and grabbed it from the ground, putting the chain around his neck. He stood over the wounded girl, pointing his staff at her. Do not move. It is your time to pay the price for all the torment you've caused. His staff began to glow once more, and I felt as if he was about to kill her. Whatever she had done, she didn't deserve such a harsh punishment, did she? Hey, what are you doing? I shouted, running over. Stop! You, you can't kill her! A look of annoyance passed over his face. He opened his mouth to say something when I saw her moving on the ground. The girl pulled something from her pocket, dropped it to the dirt. A black cloud of smoke suddenly appeared, causing us to cough and wave at the air. By the time the fog had dissipated, she was gone. You fool! You're distracting me for a second. That's all it took. She's gone. I'll never get a chance like that again. He huffed and stomped away, walking straight towards the tree. There he stood at its base, inspecting it wiping it off as if she had dirtied it with her fingers. Okay, what? I'm confused. Who are you? Who is she? What's the deal with this tree and the key and the... What did you do to me? I shot lightning with my finger! Turning around, he looked at me and smiled warmly. You did, didn't you? And I suppose you did sort of save my life, in a way. Maybe... Maybe you'll make a decent apprentice, after all. That night I lay in bed wide awake, unable to sleep after all that had happened. I could still feel the power humming through my veins and wanted nothing more than to express it again like a young musical savant who had just learned to play the guitar and knows that a Les Paul is nearby and just waiting to be played. The man from the forest had introduced himself as Xavier Vasi. He was a sorcerer. 
Not only that, but he was the guardian of this realm, he told me. The most powerful one in each world was given the duty to protect the tree. And he had been granted the task from his mentor before him. My training would begin the following day after school, he told me. And I would have a lot to learn. Especially since I was one day going to be the new guardian of the tree. The key which hung from Xavier's neck would one day hang across my own. Who would have thought? Just then I heard something from the shadows in my darkened bedroom. A rustling sound like movement. I pulled the chain and turned on the lamp at my bedside. My heart trip-hammering with fear. There was no one there. But I had heard something I was sure of. I pulled the chain again and the room was plunged into the darkness once more. Even blacker than before because my eyes were not adjusted to it. Sound was there again, moving, rustling, footsteps drawing closer. I heard someone breathing as if they were standing over me in the night watching me. Crickets were no longer chirping outside. Frogs and toads had stopped making their sounds. All was quiet except for the sound of her breathing. Standing over me. Observing me. My heart was beating in my throat. Fear filling every inch of me as she hovered over me purple orbs beginning to faintly glow and I realized it was her eyes the smell of the berry lip gloss she had worn when she kissed me filled my nostrils and I felt like like butterflies were fluttering in my stomach at the scent but also a growing sense of doom of horror of the smell which lingered beneath that the stench of death so you're the one who will be Xavier's apprentice. How delightful. I pulled the chain again and the light came on. Unthinkingly, I had made a finger gun with my hand and was pointing at where she had been standing. But nothing had happened. And of course, she was gone. Her laughter could be faintly heard through the window, coming from outside. But the scent of her stayed with me faintly on my lips I realized I might be in a lot of trouble Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepasta and I wanted to tell you, thank you for watching today's video on YouTube or listening to tonight's episode of the podcast If you guys are watching on YouTube, then that means you can find the podcast on Spotify or anywhere else that you happen to listen to podcasts. And if you guys are listening on the podcast, hey, if you want to find some older episodes or a whole bunch of stories you've never seen before, you should check out youtube.com slash MrCreepyPasta. And no matter where you are, I really appreciate you hitting that subscribe button and hitting that bell reminder, just so that you can always find a new story as soon as it becomes available. And I want to give a big thank you, as always, to all of my Patreon subscribers on Patreon. Pa patron? All my patrons on Patreon. You guys are the real MVPs. You are the ones that allow me to do stuff, like getting specific stories just for the channel. All those wonderful things that come from Dale Drake, those are because of all of you. If you guys want to see more of that, then I would really, really, really love if you guys could help support on Patreon.com slash MrCreepyPasta like some of these wonderful guys, such as Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Stephanie Butler, Bobby Carmen, Tristan Pelton, Chance Burnett, Diana Krause, Chaos Arts, Cryolinian, Milk and Meal, Silty K. Sterlerson, Zachary Graphius, It's All About That Fucking Music, Gorang Trimegacy, Maria Walker, Tanya Oren, Pain Gravy, Crazy Kid, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Ika Limchak, Dirt Diver 030, Matt Bach, Jack Dabbles Raz, Voice of Sand, Coffee Zombie, Matthew McNeese, Chelly J, Jeremy H, Raltazal, Ficomel, Nana, Nick Weaver, Melted Lake, Tolly Sue, Sky Mara Ravenswood, William King, Darth Milver, Michael Ortiz, Satanic Aries, Nessie, Bardo Hawk 764, Lambda M98, Harley, Billy Morrow, Sashi Sazaku, My Body Sounds Like Rice Krispies, Kaylee Ambrose, Suji Campbell, Stricken, Azarine Fox, Freddy Krueger, Nicholas Zaccardi, Happy Birthday Jason Wilson, Lisa Cottrell, Caspian, Hades Nephew, Tater Chip, Acid System, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Cryptic Nightmares, Kiri the Sloth, Tommy Green, Fester Lampshade, Sky Harbor, Nico Kyle, Raphael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Paulson, Trace Miles, and Corey Kenshin. You guys, as well as everybody if you look down in the description, and everybody that can even just give one dollar to be able to help things out, I really appreciate it. If you guys would like to join this list of names that I horribly, horribly mispronounce, check out patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta, and honestly, even you guys who just listen, you watch, you comment, you like, you subscribe, thank you all. I really appreciate it. And sweet dreams. <laughs>